For most of us, death is the end of our physical existence. Death is final and irreversible. I'm expecting when I die to be frozen. They're going to just keep my head and brain in suspension at minus 196 centigrade for hundreds of years. At Alcor in California, they're preparing dead bodies for the deep freeze. These people believe in cryonic suspension, the practice of storing legally dead bodies at very low temperatures. If you're a cryonicist, this is not a dead body, it's a patient. I had no idea what form I would be coming back as, um, because the technology available would just be capable of doing almost anything. I imagine what would happen is that they, 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 they would essentially scan your brain um, in its frozen state and then reconstruct that first and then basically ask your mind, you know, you, what, what type of body do you want to come back as? The first stage in the cryonic suspension process is to restore circulation and breathing artificially. And this is done with a heart-lung resuscitator. Then we wash out the patient's blood with a heart-lung machine that's mounted on this cart and replace it with Viaspan, which is an organ preservation solution. This allows us to safely transport the patient, and we do that, bring the patient into the facility here. The patient is then moved from this cart onto the operating table, and we then connect the patient to a heart-lung machine. The heart-lung machine allows us to introduce protective drugs into the patient's body to help minimize the damage that we do from freezing. One of the drugs that we use is glycerol. It's a thick, syrupy liquid that is diluted with a blood substitute and used to replace about half of the water in the patient's body. Once this is done, if the patient's a neuropatient, his head or her head is surgically isolated from the rest of the body, the body's cremated, if it's a whole body patient, the patient is placed in a uh, sleeping bag and cooled to liquid nitrogen temperature. In either case, storage goes on at liquid nitrogen temperature, which is about 200 degrees below zero centigrade. In the United Kingdom, those who've signed up for cryonic suspension meet every month. It's the Cryonic Social Club. They hope to come back to life in the future, so they figure they'll need a few old friends with similar experiences. We haven't got to thaw them. No, all we've no. got to do is freeze them transport people through to future technology, use chronics with today's in, imperfections ambulance. as an ambulance for the future. Show. As a metaphor yeah. for the future. That's it. As yet, Alcor UK's ambulance hasn't been used. They're waiting for one of their group to die. In the future, the workings of, of the human metabolism are going to be as well understood as cars are nowadays. If a car malfunctions, your car doesn't just die and become completely worthless. What you do is that you take it along to a garage and you have it repaired. What cryonics is like essentially is just sticking your car, your body, into a lock-up garage for a hundred years until the technology comes around to put it, to put it back in working order again. So if cryonicists think they can be revived from the dead, what's their definition of death? Well, sometimes the best way to understand something is to use an example. And this is an example that most people should be familiar with. This is a computer disk. They store information, just like our brains store information. If I take this computer disk and I cut it in half, clearly it won't, it won't function anymore. It won't run. And yet, all of the information that makes the disk up is still here. And it's possible, in theory, to put the two halves back together again. However, there's another way you could damage this. I could light this on fire. And when I do, the information is gone forever. There's no way that we know of, with our current understanding of physics and science, that we'd ever be able to recover information from a system, a computer disk in this case, that's damaged in this way. And the same is true of biological systems. You and I are made up of material, made up of atoms. And when the pattern of atoms that makes us up is disrupted in this kind of way, rather than in this kind of way, we're lost forever. What cryonics is all about is preventing 
this kind of damage from turning into this kind of damage. I don't want to die. And should I walk across the street tomorrow and get hit by a bus, Alcor may be my only chance. Any chance is better than nothing at all. This room is the patient care area of the Alcor facility. Currently, we have seven whole body patients in storage here. These containers are topped off, filled with liquid nitrogen, approximately once every two weeks. This vault contains neuro patients, patients who've chosen to have just their heads placed in cryonic suspension. Currently, we're filling the container, servicing it by adding liquid nitrogen to it. There are eight patients in storage in this unit. We have a variety of uh, people in suspension. There's a physician in there, a medical doctor, a uh, speech correctionist, um, a liquor store owner and his wife, um, a couple career military officers, a wide range of people who want a second chance at life. Of course, I've heard that the odds of this working, I've heard them quoted at anything from a one in a million to one in a hundred. This is Miles. We met five years ago in a laboratory where we put him to sleep, packed him in ice, chilled him to 50 Fahrenheit, replaced his blood with blood substitute, kept him down for over an hour. Miles was clinically dead at the time. He had no brain waves, had no heartbeat, and of course had no reflexes. Warmed him up, put blood back in him, and brought him back to life. He's lived with us ever since in perfectly good health. To give you an idea of how normal he is, I'm gonna show you his ability to walk like a circus dog is one great trick in pursuit of cheese. These dogs don't naturally walk around so easily on their hind legs. If he was brain damaged, there'd be a good likelihood that he couldn't balance quite so well. Cost for neurosuspension or head-only suspension is around 31,000 pounds. Neuro patients go in containers such as you see here. They're very compact and easy to store. Cost for a whole body suspension is approximately 90,000 pounds, and whole body patients are stored four to each unit, such as you see there. You don't have to raise the money until after you're dead, so an insurance, life insurance policy seems the best way of doing it. And it's quite cheap. I think it's only about five or 10 pounds a month. It's a lot less than smoking. With current technology, the main problems with cryonics fall into four areas. The first is that a patient who's presented for cryonic suspension has already suffered a terminal illness from which they haven't been able to be cured. And the second is that they've already been declared clinically dead, a process which is at the moment irreversible. And then the process of the cryonic suspension itself, to take a whole body and freeze it, imposes irreversible damage on the complex tissues and organs of which it's made up. And the fourth is that in order to rewarm a frozen body, the thawing process itself imposes yet more damage on the tissues. If cryonics is going to work, the brain has to survive being frozen and thawed. And the thing that makes me hesitate to say that cryonics is completely crazy is simply the fact that Every paper that's ever been written on the subject of freezing brains or brain tissue or brain cells has essentially always shown that you get almost complete recovery, no matter what the technique was, no matter how poor the technique was. And in fact, even if the technique was applied to quote unquote dead brain tissue. And so it makes me wonder about how much damage is actually happening in a large brain. Maybe a brain uh, has less damage than some of the organs that people have studied. Dying is not a sudden process. Various organs of the body die at different rates. The brain dies very quickly. The liver takes longer, the kidneys longer still, and the kidneys are probably still alive about two hours after the patient has died. We make use of this when we do our organ transplants. Now, when it comes to thinking about the brain, that is a different matter. Because at the moment, we can't transplant a brain, even if the brain is still alive, because the nerves of the brain don't grow. How much less, therefore, will we be able to transplant a brain that has been frozen? And this, in my opinion, makes a complete nonsense of the whole concept of cryonics, people being frozen at death. 
At the moment, I think the whole of the arguments in favor of this must be described as pseudoscience. I know a lot of people are making a lot of money out of persuading people to be frozen at death. And of course, I'm not going to stop people having whatever they want done to their body when they die. But I do think people must realize that there is no way that they are going to be reanimated, not with the current state of knowledge. Is it possible to imagine ways of repairing cells that uh, we don't have today? And if you could imagine a machine that repaired cells, you might imagine something that looked a lot like a cell, because cells repair cells, and cells are machines. And the question is, could we make machines similar in complexity to a cell? And many people think that we can. So back to the question of cryonics. Is it something that's crazy? Is it something that cannot work? I can't tell, because I still don't know if future technology will ever be able to reverse present damage. Dr. Paul Siegel is researching into the possibilities of operating on living people at low temperatures. Operating on a patient at 37 centigrade with the heart beating, the brain working, the lungs breathing, is kind of like trying to fix a car with the engine running. The problem is, he's got to stop and start humans as easily as a car. That's what he's attempting to do with this hamster, just as he did with Miles the dog. Paul Siegel thinks it shows that clinical death can be reversible. Having injected the hamster with an anesthetic, they cool it down. After about a minute, you can just bury him in crushed ice. This shows the hamster's heartbeat. He's beating at about uh, 30 beats per minute. Normal heart rate for these animals run over 300. That heartbeat will very soon... At soon about three out. Celsius, they stop its heart beating. He's arrested. Let's cut the respirator. At this point, the animal is in cardiac arrest and therefore can be said to be clinically dead. The blood's replaced with an alternative liquid to ensure he will revive. The hamster has now been clinically dead for over 25 minutes. To revive him, they've got to pop his blood back and warm him up. I think we've got a beat here. That's a good sign. Is this, what? Oh, it's, just, it's almost 30 beats per minute. It's about 20, 28 beats a minute. Yeah, if you jolt up, then watch his chest. He's starting to breathe. He's breathing. He's moving. I can pull a, we can pull a respirator, too. He's breathing on his own now. Temperature's rising, and within an hour, he looks almost normal. Ordinarily, a hamster like this would be expected to recover and live long term. Can this be used as evidence that clinical death is not final? And does it say anything about whether cryonics will work or not? One of the questions that Dr. Siegel's experiments with the hamster raise is whether the hamster was in fact clinically dead. Well, my belief is that probably it wasn't clinically dead because there have been some very well-documented cases of human beings who've been trapped under the ice in water. And in fact, in that situation when the body is cooled down, the, 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 the oxygen demands of the brain become very slight. And even though the heart is not working and the blood is not circulating and the lungs are not filling with, with air, uh, it's possible that there's enough residual oxygen for the brain to remain very minimally active. I think that at some point when we get better with our technology, when possible, chronic suspensions will start after death, and that's when we can show that this is a reversible technology. However, just because a person is dead by today's standards, it doesn't mean that person is dead by tomorrow's standards. to me that the issue of cryonics raises, as well as scientific questions, moral questions as well. And as with any moral question, those are issues that have to be discussed and decided upon by all of us. And it seems to me that the ethical questions that cryonics raises are of two kinds. The first is whether it's appropriate that money should be put into research and into cryonics itself in order to extend the life the quantity of life for some individuals 
when the quality of life for so many people is very poor and for example there are many people who don't have enough to eat and the second question is really a wider one and that concerns whether this is an appropriate thing for us to be striving to do medicine has allowed us to live for longer than we used to in the past and the question is how far do we want to extend this and how far will this put the balance of nature out After organs are removed from heart-beating cadavers, they only have a certain limited time that they can stay alive before they're transplanted. You can only keep a kidney alive for three days, a heart alive for half a day, a liver alive for a day and a half. We would like to break this time barrier by being able to cool organs to very low temperatures. Once the organs are cooled to very low temperatures, you should be able to store them as long as you want. The problem is, if they're allowed to freeze, they'll die. We have a technique which we are trying to develop in my laboratory called vitrification. Vitrification would allow the organs to be cooled to very, very low temperatures without freezing. These two beakers contain different concentrations of antifreeze suitable for living organs. The one on the right is very concentrated. The left one is mainly water. Liquid nitrogen cools the beakers, and at minus 120 degrees Celsius, the left one has completely frozen, whereas the concentrated antifreeze solution has become very gooey. As the temperature drops further, it becomes so thick that it solidifies. It becomes a glass. This is known as the vitrified state. If we try to preserve a kidney in the left beaker, it will freeze, but one placed in antifreeze solution will vitrify. These two kidneys were injected with liquid rubber which set. The kidneys were sliced open to reveal their internal structures. And as you can see, the vitrified kidney's internal structure is normal, whereas the internal structure on the frozen kidney shows severe damage. In this kidney, massive cracks have developed Ice formation in the kidney is, is accompanied by a lot of mechanical stress, which leads to this cracking. So this would obviously be a disastrous situation in a, in a kidney that was to be transplanted. So we do believe that vitrification better preserves the structure of the kidney. Now, where do we go with this technique? This is a human kidney. As you can see, this human kidney dwarfs the rabbit kidneys in size. And the problems of applying this technique of vitrification to an organ this size is, are significant. We don't know if we'll be able to overcome those problems, but we have hope that we'll be able to overcome those problems and thereby allow more people to receive life-saving transplants uh, in the future and have better lives and longer lives as a result of that.